we're able to create something that is simple enough that people that don't code can grasp it. There's always going to be like that salesperson or that marketing person that wants to do like some sort of automation. And if we unlock them to do that without having to go through engineering, that is immense value add for both teams because we want to ship a UI where people can build this agent super easily and build this group of agents super easily. And then also just give the ability from them to convert from UI to code and code to UI and make that super simple. Thanks for coming on the show, Joao. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm excited about this. Me too. I've been looking forward to this. Um, I obviously know all about you and what you're doing, but for those who don't, why don't you just start us off with a quick background on who you are and what you're building? A hundred percent. So the short version is I have been tech for 20 years, messed up around with a bunch of different things, AI being one of them. I started doing AI back in 2017. What I thought was late, but turns out it was kind of like early accounting for everything that is happening right now. Uh, back then was basically a lot of like regression and classification models and all that. Uh, and now I'm building Crew AI, uh, a platform for building and shipping multi-agent systems. Perfect. So there's so much just to unpack with that alone. <laughs> But I'd say let's let's start at like the fundamentals. You're someone who's building a very successful startup in the AI space. You've also been doing it, like you said, since 2017. So that's seven years. So very OG in, in that sense, unless you've been doing kind of machine learning for, since the, the aughts. What would you actually define as AI? Because it's a broad term. It's bandied about. We also have Gen AI. But what do you define as AI? And then maybe contrast it against Gen AI. And then we'll get into agents and everything else. I could talk about this for hours. This is such a good question. Honestly, I, I think people like, uh, people got too hooked up in this idea of AI and, and black boxes and everything. In the end of the day, those are all prediction models, right? You're trying to predict something. And so you basically have a set of features or, uh, or like attributes that you want to use. And there is one specific attribute that you're trying to, uh, predict. And then you basically show an, uh, a computer, a lot of examples, and this computer will use math and statistics to kind of like figure out how those features and those attributes correlate in order to infer the data that you don't have. So if you show enough examples, it's going to try to pick up all those hints and then basically it compounds in the final equation and that equation then it can be used to predict or classify other things. So in the end of the day, AI is, is math. Uh, it's basically trying to like find correlations between things in order to infer another thing. So that's the way that I would define AI. For non-technical people, what was that change that happened between having the transformer versus pre-transformer kind of that GPT moment, that chat GPT, that kind of inflection point that we encountered two years ago, what was that shift that fundamentally made it feel so different, even if it is just a prediction model underlying everything? Yeah, a hundred percent. And honestly, I think the other thing as well, it's uh, people don't realize, but like uh, things like GPT have been around for a while. Like uh, it, it now, like it's like on fire and like everyone's talking about this, but yeah, you're right. Like the transformers paper that launched it a few years ago, got everyone super excited and applying this into these prediction models where LLMs are still prediction models, but what they're trying to predict is the next token or for people that are non-technical, they're just trying to predict how to complete a sentence. So what is the next piece of word, the next word that come after all the words that have been so far. Uh, so in this case, like if you want to oversimplify it, it's a still a prediction model. The difference is that the features or the arguments you're taking into account now is all the text that happened before and what you're trying to predict is what will come next. So uh, yes, when that paper came out, everyone kind of like was over it and they're like, all right, we need to apply transformers to everything. Uh, and people were doing uh, a lot of experiments. So I think if you go back to GPT-2, I think that was around, I don't know how, how long, but I think it was a few years even before ChatGPT came out. Um, and even GPT-3, I heard that it was like, it was available for people to try it out, but didn't have the chat UI and no one really talked about this. So as I think we have seen with other techs, like 
Uber, for example, right moment, the right time with GPS and like seller connection and all that. Uh, I think we also are experiencing this with AI now, like OpenAI pushing ChatGPT and that bringing like everyone's attention into that and then the Transformers and ever this technology that now empowers you to have this production and business use cases. I think that's getting everyone kind of like super excited and ramping up. So I think it's just like the right time when, when all the right technologies converge and then you can make like those things available and people go crazy over it. They are going crazy. In terms of, uh, in terms of agents, so now we're kind of getting to the crux of Crew AI, but let's start with what is an agent and how is that different or not different from ChatGPT? That's a good point. I think a lot of people are talking about agents uh, in so many different settings. And I think like people are starting to converge. Um, my understanding and what I have been kind of like fighting over and say like, hey, this is what an agent is. It's basically the idea of an LLM that takes leverage from the fact that it has a level of... Um, it has a reasonable understand because it has a reasonable understanding of the language. It can take a reasonable, what looks like reasonable decisions, because of the text that it's been trained on. It almost feels like it has some reason. So basically, you want to leverage that capability from LLMs to allow them to autonomously operate and do things. So that's the way that I would differ. Like if you think about ChatGPT or regular LLM models, you're basically either chatting with it or having it to complete text that you're sending. Now, if you can leverage the ability for of it to reason or to look like it's reasoning in order to autonomously take actions and having this inner thought process, then it's where kind of like you remove the user from being a blocker on the interaction. And that's the point where you get an autonomous agent. So yeah, putting in simple terms, I would say while you are chatting and you're a part of the equation, you don't have an agent. The moment that you can remove yourself from the equation and that LLM can interact with itself, that would be my definition of an agent. I think that's a really, really good definition because we're familiar with a dialogue, right? You and I, as humans are having a dialogue and it's two parties that are talking back and forth. I say something, you say something. And you can do that with technology too. I say something to ChatGPT, it says something back and it's a dialogue. But to your point, when that AI, that agent, that ChatGPT, that whatever, goes out and then acts, right? And it takes action based on steps. And specifically, it's different than deterministic code kind of, you know, you click a button and then it goes and updates your Facebook post or, or status. This is taking direction and then it's, quote unquote, fake thinking, right? It's, it's trying to use reasoning to determine what should the steps it take be that starts separating from, it's not a dialogue anymore, right? It's not just deterministic code that's written to do a particular function when you click this button, update X, Y, and Z. It's now figuring out its own path of how to act in the world or with other agents or on its own. And I think that is a very, very good kind of delineation because the conversations around agents is a little ambiguous. Where do you draw the line? But I think that's a, a really good frame of reference. I think, I think your own point, and honestly, I think it doesn't even to take an action. I think even if you, going back to how people are interacting with ChatGPT, what happens a lot of the times is like you go into it, you ask it to do something, kind of sucks, and then you basically give it some feedback up to the point that gets like great, and you're like, oh, this is amazing. Got a few interactions, but we got there. So I would say like the agent doesn't even need to like perform any actions. If it's able to basically kind of like self-critique, like that is that alone is already like an agentic behavior where like you say, hey, write me an amazing email or an amazing newsletter or, or anything that you want to generate tax form. And it can self-critique up to the point that it gets into a point that it feels good about it. Uh, and you didn't have to get involved in. I would say that's agentic behavior already. And I think you got the nail in the head there. The way the way that I'm thinking about like the technology in general now is that you have regular like apps, so, like software that we have been developing throughout the years, the things that we are used to. And those regular apps, they're known for being like strong typed. So you have strong types, you have strong typed inputs, you have clear logic, strong type outputs. So you feel a form. For any non-technical people, it's it's basically where you're very rigorous in your definition, 
of your code of what it should be and should not be. Exactly. So basically you're saying like, hey, I'm going to write this function. This function is going to get a name. This name is a text. And then I'm going to check if this name is bigger than X. And if it is, I'm going to do Y. So you have all this like clear set of instructions. But now with everything that is getting built on top of AI, I think we're getting a new category of software that's kind of like AI software. And that is fuzzy in all of its shapes and forms. So it's fuzzy inputs, fuzzy logic, and the fuzzy output. So uh, it's like, and, and I think there's like reasons for you to want that, right? Because if you think about the word, the word is a fuzzy place or just a bunch of atoms squashed in different ways. So I think like there, there are use cases where you want fuzzy inputs and fuzzy outputs. And there are cases where you want like very rigorous steps and descriptions and replicable results. I completely agree. In terms of the, 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 the shift that we're having, it's, it's kind of like this opening world of being able to work in unstructured environments, unstructured data. And to your point, the world is a fuzzy place. And so to finally have technology start representing that a little bit better, it's, it's going to unlock a lot more use cases and capabilities. And even if you extend that code is called a programming language. It's a specific different language for how to interact with computers. And this is how it's been for, you know, 50 years, 60 years. That's it's always, the languages have shifted, but it's always been a different language that you need to learn if you want to talk to computers and get them to do something. And so now we're finally bridging that gap of, well, what if we just talk to computers, how we normally talk, what happens then? And so you kind of start opening up this world of different possibilities and capabilities that previously weren't, weren't able to be used. Yeah. And then again, I think this, if you, if you go to the core of it, this is what got people so impressed with this new tech, right? Because now like they can get their fuzzy outputs, their thoughts, their writing with their typos and their lingo and everything. And they can just throw at this and somehow they have a fuzzy output. They have something that they can work with. So, uh, yeah, I think like a lot of like the aha moments and the woe factors is that like now anyone can interact and you can basically stream whatever fuzzy thoughts you have uh, into this and you're going to get good responses back. This brings us to what you are doing. <laughs> what the hell is Crew AI? Honestly, Crew AI is one, a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Crew AI is, it started as a framework. So if you go on the web and you search Crew AI, or if you go on YouTube and search Crew AI, what you're going to see is a bunch of tutorials and people telling you how you can use this framework. And the framework here for the non-technical folks is basically like a, a set of tools that make it super easy for programmers to do certain things. And in this case, Crew AI is a set of tools that makes it super easy for you to create the autonomous agents that we were talking about. So to build applications around like those AIs that can basically have code and code inner thinking processes and take actions and interact with other applications. Uh, so that's how it started, but uh, things grown up pretty fast uh, and we had turned this into a company. So uh, we have been running Cray AI now for a few months and have been a lot of fun. And basically we have been building this framework that is allowing a bunch of not only engineers, but even people that have like no code understanding is now like literally making money because they're building things with crew. And that just blows my mind when I learn about these use cases and I see what people are doing. Uh, I, and yeah, we have doing a lot of things and building this framework and also building this company. So we are also working with enterprises, offering kind of like more enterprise packages and enterprise deals to things that you don't get for free when you're using the framework, but you still want to use, especially when you're deploying this on more business related settings. We've, we've been using Korea and it's definitely a very impressive framework. And obviously you're evolving and you're shipping very, very quickly of new features, new capabilities. I want to highlight examples though, because I think again, in this world of AI, it's, it can be so heady so quickly and it can be confusing as to what are we talking about and what does that actually mean? So do you mind just kind of sharing an example? And maybe, you know, I saw you posted a video recently of, of someone who had no technical experience setting up a crew and like you said, making money, but highlight an example for kind of the, the, the individual as to what you might use a crew and setup for. And then we can come back to the business side after that. 
A hundred percent. Yes. So right now, fun fact, we, there's no day that goes by where we don't get at least 80,000 Moody agent systems executed using Core AI. That's the bottom line. Yeah. We already had days that we went up to like 400,000 executed in a single day. And that's kind of like, that's crazy for me. Um, so yeah, we, we basically see a bunch of use cases and there's definitely, it's definitely like a, a long tail distribution. So you have a few cases that are very common and we see a bunch of people doing it and they can highlight those, but then you have just long tail of a bunch of like smaller use cases, very niche that people are building and integrations and agents and all that. And it's so interesting. So the most common use cases that we see where the systems like work super well, they are reliable when people like are getting value from it is a lot of marketing use cases. So from like basically smashing researching and content creation together. So you can have, for example, a group of AI agents where you one agent's going to do research on a product. Another one's going to do research on competitors. A third one is going to like basically uh, try to create a copy. So something that you could do some marketing about. And then a fourth one can talk with an API and creates like an image. So now you have these four agents working for you and it can help you create marketing materials. So marketing in general is like use cases that we have been seeing pop up very often, uh, especially research. So research everything about this product, this company, figure out how it sets like apart comparing to X or Y or Z, and then content generation. Like now using that, let's create content that we can use for marketing and all of that. And uh, sometimes that's newsletter, sometimes that is Instagram posts, uh, honestly, uh, very broad. Uh, sales is another big use case, um, especially around the enrichment side of things and also like prepping. So it's less about like, Hey, let's get an AI to like, to basically be our salesperson and sell to us or sell for us. Uh, it's more like, Hey, can we actually make the life of our sales team easier? If we have a few agents basically do a bunch of research on our leads, come up with talking points compare them with for like ideal customer profile, kind of cross that with our offerings and just like then provide all that as ammunition from the salesperson, maybe even write an initial like email. And then the person, like the salesperson comes in and like they can decide on how to use that information. Like if they're going to send this email or not, if they want to like do further researching, if they want to like use the talking points. So uh, sales, another big one. Um, so marketing and sales, overall reporting and researching, I think in general have been like great use cases. Uh, I would expect to see more support because support is such like a no brainer, but honestly, we don't see support coming up that like often. Customer support. Yeah. Customer support, like reaching out, like more of like regular chats and all that. We do see some of that, but it's not as much as I would expect it to be. Um, and also development, people are trying to look like, hey, can we actually use this for like writing code or writing docs, uh, anything related to kind of speeding up the development cycle. And then again, then you have like and, the long tail. <laughs> yeah. So like infinite number of use cases really of, of, of being able to kind of spin up these agents to do work. Are, are you seeing that still it's mostly engineers that are kind of building out these tools for marketing, for sales or, or for development or whatever use case they have? Or are you kind of branching into more and more kind of lowering the barrier of entry for being able to spin up a crew, set the tasks for the different agents within that crew and have them go execute? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think like now we are, uh, now we're trying to make it easier, lower the entry barrier. So for us, because from the get go, we position ourselves as kind of like a platform and we have the framework for engineers that is basically our distribution channel. So a bunch of like the people that come to know crew and use crew basically come from engineering. We have some people that don't, and that's like, they come up with all amazing use cases. And I think that we're able to create something that is simple enough that people that don't code can grasp it. That's great, but that's a still a high entry barrier. So we're definitely like, we're working on the UI to allow people to kind of like build these agents like themselves on the UI. And the way that we're thinking about this is that they're always going to be custom use cases, right? And those are going to be the most rewarding ones. So engineering is going to be working on these very custom use cases, but then 
there's always going to be like that salesperson or that marketing person that wants to do like some sort of automation. And if we unlock them to do that without having to go through engineering, that is an immense value add for both teams. So uh, definitely something that we are like currently working on uh, because we want to ship a UI where people can build this agent super easily and build this group of agents super easily. And then also just give the ability from them to convert from UI to code and code to UI and make that super simple. Exciting times. I, I'm definitely curious to see kind of as that barrier to entry is lowered, what are more use cases that are unlocked by people that are non-technical or less technical? And even in terms of agents themselves, you know, there's kind of this 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 argument that AI is going to replace jobs. And I'm on the opposite side, which is I think it's going to enhance people's work and, and expand jobs. But the concept of having a bunch of agents working for you or with you to do those lo lower level tasks, what it really does is it empowers the person, and in my opinion at least, to be able to focus on the highest and best use of their time. So if you are very skilled at sales, how much time do you want to spend updating a CRM or doing basic research that you could have an intern do? And so by kind of bringing these tools in, it's not that it's necessarily doing and executing everything, but it's supporting you for the things that only you can do. And so I think that is kind of the frame that I take with all these different agents and multi-agent architectures is empowering the human to be even better at their job or do more of the parts that they like and less of the parts they don't like. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think of all the companies that we have been talking with and the companies that are actually deploying these things in production, what we're realizing is the ones that do the best are the ones that are framing this internally as we're not replacing anyone. We're promoting everyone. So everyone now gets to be manager of these agents. And honestly, it's just like another, like it's another tool, right? It's, as you said, like you would basically delegate and say like, all right, this agent's going to do the research for me. This one's going to write a few emails. And in the end of the day, you're basically saving a lot of hours. I can tell for some of internal use cases, like we at Crew AI are basically do we a lot of dog fooding. So we're using our own product to make sure that we move faster. It yes, crew saves us hours a week. Like I would say dozens of hours. Um, so we use it some of the technical side. For example, all the documentations for crew AI is written by a crew. Um, uh, all the benchmarking that we do with crew AI is done by a crew. And we do a lot of like sales as well. So like all the lead scoring that is done by a crew. So the crew actually research each lead, come up with talking points, give them a score. So yeah, we have like, we have been using this and yeah, it's, it's just frees you up to focus on the important stuff and allows you to now have this tool that you can delegate work to. You touched on kind of dog fooding it, which, which segues us into maybe a bigger business use cases for crews and kind of what that next phase is as traditional enterprises migrate more and more towards using AI and using these tools. And I know you launched Crew AI Plus recently to kind of coincide a bit with some of those efforts. So what, what exactly is Crew AI Plus? Yeah, so Crew AI Plus basically is a few different things. Uh, it's a package that come with four main pillars. The first one is a platform. So you get a UI, you get the ability to deploy your multi-agent systems to production, and you got to do that pretty fast. Because one thing that we notice on the open source is that people like can build amazing things and like they have like this multiple agent systems that work, but they're all running on their computers, on their terminals. So it's very technical. How do you bring that into the real world? This only becomes useful if you can integrate with existing software. So create, I basically fast track anyone that wants to do that. So the main feature that people got super excited about is this idea of like, you can get whatever you build with Crew AI, these multi-agent systems, into a production setting within minutes without having to change one line of code. So you basically push it to GitHub, you select your crew, and you click on deploy. And now that it's live, there's an API with all the production-grade stuff that you want, like a private VPC behind a, a SSL, and with auto scaling and everything. So I think that's the main feature that people get excited. But on top of that, we offer templates on that platform. The UI is gonna be dropped on that platform for people to create this. Uh, there are logs, you can connect with these APIs to REST and other methods. 
So there's a bunch that we are shipping in there. The idea is basically to allow companies that are going to deploy what they build with the open source in a production setting to do that super fast. And if they want to do that themselves with Valkyrie AI+, Plus, they will still be able to. It's just that's going to take a lot more time. Uh, so that's basically what I have been doing. And then, of course, like with any enterprise offering, like we come with the whole package. So proper support, proper documentation, the proper security, single sign-on, SLAs, everything that like, honestly, if like you have a big company and you want to deploy agents in production, you kind of need to have that. Otherwise, like you, you can't. Uh, for compliance reasons alone, but also for the sake of having something that you can trust that's going to work on your production environment. Yeah, absolutely. The The open source business model, I think, has always been fascinating to me because when you hear about it the first time, you're like, oh, it's, 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 it's a free offering. How could that be a business? But then when you actually break it down, it's, yes, if you want to build it yourself, here's, here are the tools and you can do it and here's our documentation. But if you want it done for you, or if you want a lot more support, a, a more robust platform, faster to move, more enterprise grade security, as, et cetera, then, oh, here's this other option. And it gives you kind of the best of both worlds, depending on where you are as the individual or the entity that's kind of making the choice between the options. Uh, one thing that I think will start becoming interesting as we move more and more into this agentic multi-agent framework world, because I do think agent frameworks are going to be a very big driver conceptually of advancing AI to the next level beyond what we've seen with chatbots and rag implementations over the previous kind of six or 12 months. Where do you highlight the differentiation between crew AI versus kind of the other leaders, which I think would be Autogen and then, you know, Google recently announced Vertex AI. So where do you kind of stack up in that? And, and what do you think is going to be biggest driver for choosing which framework you build on top of? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So yeah, uh, I think, as you said, like in enterprise offering, I, I think like it's pretty good in here. And um, just to highlight one thing that I think is important as well, I think like people get too hanged up sometimes on like, oh, this needs to be open source, needs to be closed source. But I think there's a lot of things between like the two, right? You can always have like, hey, let's do a free account where you get access to extra features. So yeah, I think there's like, Honestly, like it's it's just very interesting how software can be so dynamic and you can play like in so many different ways. When you look at like the competitive landscape for AI agents right now, you have other open source frameworks. I think AutoGem is probably the biggest one out there. Um, and I think they're doing great. Honestly, when I was doing like, when I was building the first version of Crew, it came from a need that I had myself. I was building some agents myself and I went to build more of them. So I looked into AutoGem. And I personally didn't feel like it fit what I needed. I was like, I I understand some of the choices here, but this feels hard. It feels like a very steep curve for learning it. And I just I just felt like that's not what I wanted. Uh, then I look at other stuff that was around like chat dev, and I was amazed by it. I was like, hey, this like has role playing delegation. This alpha is super interesting, but then like is not mentioned, is not minted by a for a, a production setting. So I was like, all right, so this is not what I want. So I think like for the lack of the options that would fit what I wanted is how I got to build Crew AI. And what I wanted was something that was that simple in terms of like how you can use it. So I bought a lot of like my experience with like Rails, for example, that sometimes can be borderline magical and some people love it, some people hate it for it. Uh, I brought a lot of that experience into Crew AI. So like, if you look at it, it's almost like writing plain English. Like it doesn't feel like you're writing Python or a programming language um, because that's what I wanted. I wanted to make it super easy for me to basically create these agents and do it in a way that was working super well for me. So. What I hear from the community is like when they try other frameworks out there and they come back to us, they usually come back for because of that. It's like, hey, this is like simpler. I understand what is happening. It's easier for me to roll this out. The other thing that I would highlight is also like, I think we're the only one of the open source frameworks that offer an enterprise solution right now. So yes, open source is amazing. But what happens on a random Friday when things go offline, right? Like for big companies, that's a big thing. So I think the fact that like, hey, you can actually go enterprise on us 
I think that goes a long way for uh, companies actually adopting it. What are you looking for both to hold yourself to a certain standard, but then also for agent frameworks for advancing this, this world? So you talked about lowering the barrier to entry and kind of building out uh, a GUI, a, a user interface for kind of less technical people to build on the platform, but kind of as models get better, as just you're able to build out more infrastructure, where do you want these frameworks, multi-agent frameworks to go long-term? Ah, uh, man, I have so many ideas. Uh, yes. Uh, so I think, I think this can go a lot of different ways. Uh, one, one thing that I like about us at Crew is that we are free, like we are LLM agnostic, right? So vendor lock is real. You mentioned, for example, Google Vertex. That's great. Let's say that you do that. What happens six months from now when Entropic drop in like an amazing model or GPT-5 comes out? Your vendor locked. So I I think like what I strive is for the market to make sure that they keep being vendor agnostic, similar to what CreAI does. We're like, hey, yes, if a new model comes up tomorrow, you can use that. You can basically do a one-line replacement with your multi-agent system in Pro, and all your agents are going to room this, that LLM and that's going to just work. So I would say that is part of it. The other thing as well is I think there's a lot of space for you build self-improving agents as that go. And this is something that I have been playing with Cure AI. Uh, it's kind of like something that is down on a roadmap or like it's very early on. But I would love, for example, as these agents execute, how they can automatically get better and better over time. And maybe the route to that is automatically fine tuning them. Maybe the route to that is memory and we added memory and that does seems to like help a lot. But I think there's other like ways that you can make self-improving agents. And I think that's something that I would love to see the industry move towards because then like, um, Yes, you can view like a, a multi-agent system that works, but it can get it improved over time. It becomes even more of a no-brainer. Um, so those are a few of the topics that we are like experimenting ourselves. And I think that if the market goes that route, it would be for the better of everyone involved. I'm a big fan of kind of taking tech and then breaking it down to real world analogies that people can digest. And so you know, historically with APIs or building mobile apps or web apps, it's kind of, you know, you're building a house and the API is kind of maybe the, the, the piping and the wiring behind the walls. And then the, the front end is, you know, the, the paint and the furniture or whatever. And I think for the first time with technology, when we're talking about AI, we can just relate it to people. And so as you're talking about self-improving agents, immediately my mind goes to, if you hired an intern or an army of interns, and then they start doing jobs that you assign to them, ideally you want two things to happen. One, you want to improve the instructions that they get. So you want better manuals, more clear instructions. Oh, it wasn't clear that you, you were supposed to do this, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 8 a.m. unless this thing happens. So let's give you more rules and more instructions to follow. But then also you want those people to develop in that skill. And you do that through performance reviews, looking at kind of past examples, talking with them and saying, hey, when you, when you did it this way, actually it came off in a wrong fashion. And so next time when you post to social media, also consider X, Y, and Z. And so, you know, that instance, as I envision it, would be kind of directly corollary to what you're talking about of kind of this, this self-learning, self-feedback of getting more data, aggregating better, better instructions over time for, for your agents. What's, is that accurate? Yes, that is exactly it. So I think like we, we're not too far from get from there, honestly. I think there's just like so many different ways that you could try to get to self-improving agents. And there's a good few papers around it, but I think like you need to, I, I think we just need to experiment more on how to get there. But I think this would be very interesting because exactly what you're saying, right? Like if like, if you hired someone to do this job, you would expect them to get better over time. I think like, for now, there's going to be a ceiling compared to like a person. That is sad. I think that ceiling is pretty high. I think you can get agents kind of self-specialized pretty far to the point that they're going to just work like nonstop for like 99% of the time. And, and that's okay. Within the world of AI, we have certain tranches of technology. So first there was, well, I mean, there's machine learning and it's kind of everything up to, to GPTs and, and kind of these better language LLMs, but with the advent of LLMs, there was kind of 
chat interfaces. Then there was RAG, right? So augmenting chat with, with better, you know, querying with your own documents, et cetera. And then we get into agents and we kind of have a single agent or multi agents now. Right. And so there's kind of these, these races that are going, you know, models are just going to get better. And we saw so many drop a week or two ago with Llama three and Phi and all these other ones. Right. So, so models is a, is a track of technology that's going to keep getting better. And then in terms of, you know, RAG, it is what it is, but vector databases and querying is going to, you know, there's going to be more robust tools and, and, and aspects there. We have agents, right. And multi-agents, which only really started popping up, you know, eight months ago or something like that. I know you guys started around then in terms of incorporating or kind of releasing the initial framework. Autogen was around then. So we've got agents kind of being a tranche here. Do you have any other areas of AI that you think will pop up in terms of swim lanes, or are you just purely focused on the agent framework and you think, you know, that's just that you're, you got your blinders on, you're trying to not be distracted by anything else? We, we definitely get our blinders on and trying to focus to the point that we are not even paying too much attention to competitors or just like heads down. That said, I do have an opinion on what are some of those other trenches. And I think they, I think all of that comes together, right? So you can't be like completely blind to all that because you think about the reg, now you want to bring reg into your agents. So if you think about like all those different tech, like all those different like uh, technologies as they come up, you, you kind of like, you want to them to be compound to what you're building. Uh, I think the probably like next big one that we're going to hear more and more about is multimodality. I think we just started hearing more about it a few months ago, but I think that's going to just trend up and up. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be models that can handle not necessarily one model, but maybe multiple models teach together that can handle video, audio, image, text, and all that. And again, this becomes another compounding effect because now you're on your agents to be multimodal. So uh, I think like multimodality is going to be another like big one that people are just going to talk more and more moving forward. But yeah, I have no doubts there are going to be like new waves coming uh, throughout the year for sure. I think I think you also actually touched on something which again, we've had for a bit, but it hasn't been that talked about, which is different agents working together backed by different models. And so I think that, you know, we've seen this before. We've seen examples, hugging face of kind of stitching together multiple models, one good for identifying faces, another good at identifying objects or whatever it is. But as we have more of these frameworks and you have more capabilities of having granular controls over each agent, the agents themselves, maybe you have three fives working together with one mist mistral up top kind of overseeing the, the, the lower level workers. And it's going to be interesting to see how kind of that aspect evolves as well. And really optimizing. I, I remember back in the day when, uh, rails and, and Heroku kind of were first coming out or I was first learning it in like 2012 or something, you had to perfectly fine tune your dinos and, and how many workers you had going for Redis and all these different things. And, you know, it matters less over time, but there is that optimization, optimization aspect of kind of stitching everything together and then getting more and more compounding efficiencies over time. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I think, I think yeah, that's another thing that when we build into crew, people are like, whoa, like I didn't thought that was a thing. And that is, yes, you could have three, four agents and each agent runs from a different LLM. And even ourselves, we got a few that we actually fine tune. So we get an LLM like a Mixro 7B or an Open Erms 2.5, and then we fine tune for a specific thing. And now we have this amazing agent that's great at that one thing. So uh, one example on how we use in the past that is super interesting is we basically are, we're using like an agent, like a, a crew for marketing. So we had all these agents that would do the research, that would do the reg, that would do everything. And then a final agent that would write down the message. But this agent were fine tuned on previous, ma previous messages that were written. So it would basically work as like a, a translator would translate like the final message into something that actually sounded like human and something that he would want to actually post around. So, uh, so yeah, I think fine tuned models and agents, I think there's people that might be sleeping on that. Um, but then also like with context windows getting bigger and bigger, there's another hot topic. People are like, Hey, does like this fine tuning is too that relevant? Uh, I don't know. I think it's, uh, it needs testing, uh, so that you can see like for a specific use case. But yeah, running from different models is definitely a thing because it allows you to reduce costs as well. Um, this is something that we were talking with uh, uh, an early user of, of Crew like earlier this week. And they're basically like, hey, uh, I really need to have JSON output 
and I'm using a very like small model and it's not giving me that, but it's doing everything right. All the agents are working right. So how can I do it? So good thing. Like I said, like, Hey, you can set a specific LLM just to do the JSON formatting. So again, it's teaching these things together a little bit. Like, yes, yeah, you have your like agents running from your local models and that's super cheap. And even if you push into hugging face, it's going to be on a server that costs like a oh, dollar an hour or something. And then you just do like that one call for like this final agent that does like the JSON formatting using maybe open AI or something that is more reliable. So yeah, I think like stitching things together is going to go a long way here. Yeah. It's, it's, and eventually someone will probably fine tune Phi and it'll be just the JSON Phi, you know, outputter and that's all it will do, but you can plug it in at the end of whatever workflow you're building. And then you got a super small model. That's very good at that one thing and, and does that one thing. Well, that's a great name, actually, to, uh, Jason Phi. I, I think they should right? use it. <laughs> Someone should go build it if you're listening. For for companies that are listening, I think, again, the interest with agents is you can see immediate ROI when you spin them up. It's not kind of, oh, we can now chat with our documentation and our wiki is better or chat support is better. This is, it used to take a person to uh, 100 hours to do this, and now it takes 50 hours. That's a very measurable ROI or used to take two and now it's an hour and 30 minutes. And so that's where business obviously says, oh, this makes sense. I can reduce my costs by X or I can do more with the same resources, the same team. So talk me through a scenario and maybe we just take one of the generic ones of marketing or sales. If a company is interested in crew AI or just multi-agent architectures and kind of setting them up internally, where should they start? Do you have a recommended, like download the repo, give it to your developer, have it create tweets and, and then auto tweet them or just quit, create drafts and send them to you? Like, what is that starting point for anyone that's interested in it and maybe has some resources, has some developers that can spend time on this, but they're you know overwhelmed with this open world of Gen AI and they don't quite know where to start? Yes, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think like from all of the cases that we have been seeing, the ones that click the fastest for companies and people are research and reporting. Those are usually like the ones that clicks the faster, that people can see the ROI faster because sales and marketing are all great, but usually that implies that you need to get like an expert in that. So someone that has been doing that in the company so that you can understand what are the problems so that you can understand how the automation can help them. But when you're talking about reporting or when you're talking about like research, that is more straightforward. So you know, for example, that you need to do research and reporting on leads. You know that you need to do researching and reporting on progress. You know that you need research and research. So it's just like a, a good way to kind of like try it out and have that, oh, I see the value. And then you start connecting the dots with like the different departments and different use cases and like how this could be deployed. So I would say, yes, uh, get someone to look at Crew AI. If you want to get like more specific examples, go on YouTube and search Crew AI. I'm honestly, I'm flattered by the amount of YouTube videos that I see in Crew AI. And uh, I'm nothing but thankful to the community and how much they have been building with it. And I think there's so many good ones out there. So maybe start watching a few videos that will give you a few ideas. And if you have resources available, I would say just throw Cray AI at them and say like, hey, can you build me like a research and report example on X or Y or Z? And you're gonna see uh, how you're gonna start clicking for you. But I agree with you. A lot of like the way that when we're talking to like potential leads and people they're like thinking about like, hey, how, how I go about this, that ROI conversation is part of it. Where say like, hey, if, if you build a multi-agent system that saves you 30 minutes, and again, on, I, I think this is very pessimistic. We have crews internally that saves us hours, but let's say 30 minutes. You would pay like, a, I don't know, like a, an entry level analyst, $25 an hour to do things. If you get to run this enough times in a month, you're saving hundreds of thousands of hours. So um, yeah, I would say, yeah. Definitely like make conversations pretty easy once people say like, all right, so if I do this, I save $50,000 a month or $100,000 a month. And, uh, and yeah, then like, then it clicks for them. Yeah. I mean, I know for, for one, as we have conversations implementing crew AI, same thing comes up of 
as you have more and more volume of a particular task, any amount of minutes, tens of minutes, hours that you can shave off multiplied by it's done 50,000 times a year, that becomes a massive ROI cost savings. And again, it doesn't have to mean that you don't hire people. It means you can do even more with the same people. So you have that choice. It just gives you more optionality. And then you're also owning the IP of we built this thing. It can run forever. You know, it's, it's a phenomenal asset for, for your company. So I highly recommend it. Joao, Joao, if anyone else wants to kind of check you guys out, obviously you mentioned go on YouTube to kind of look at tutorials and what people are doing to get in touch with you or, or the company themselves. What's the best way to connect and, and follow Create story? Yeah. So I, I'm very public on Twitter. I share a lot of what I'm building and like the late hours works and all of that. So yeah, I would say if you, if you want to get like drink from the fire hose, go and follow me on Twitter because I just share like everything that we're doing in there. Uh, if you're interested in like, hey, this might be a good business opportunity, especially if you're like very like, you're, you're already thinking about this. If you're like, hey, I'm actually, I'm actually ready to do like a proof of concept. I'm ready to roll it out to production. Then I would say go into our, our website, createi.com and sign up to be an early customer for CreateAI Plus. Uh, we do, we do have a lot of inbound right now, so that's good. So, but it's a problem. So <laughs> we're trying to kind of like, uh, select like this initial like group and onboard people in batches, uh, as we kind of like increase those like batch sizes. But yeah, the more information that you can get to us about like your use case and how eager you are to actually bring this into production, the better, because we're giving preference for those use cases. Perfect. Thank you so much. And we're always happy to help with uh, implementations that everyone needs extra hands as well. But Joao, this is super fun. We'll have to do this again in, in six months once you've built out many, many more features and, and the world keeps evolving on the AI side. I love that. Honestly, the future couldn't look brighter. I think it's going to be very exciting. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you.